Okay, I think I'm going to get started. It's time. Uh, my name is Warner Losh, and I'll be talking to you today about how to contribute to FreeBSD via GitHub pull requests. This is a new thing that the FreeBSD project is doing, and I wanted to give a little bit of a guide, uh, kind of a high-level overview of the process so that if you're not familiar with it, maybe you can become familiar with it and contribute. Um, I started these efforts just after we did the GitHub, or we did the Git migration. Um, there were a number of pull requests coming in to GitHub, and we handled them poorly at first. Nobody was looking at them. We didn't turn them off or anything. They just sat there and languished, and by the time we got to them, they were stale. It wasn't really a good experience for anybody. So uh, at one point, the core team asked me to focus on next steps for our Git process. The whole reason we switched to Git was so that we could do new things, and if we just kept doing the same thing, that is a lot of effort really for not a whole lot of gain, although Git is a much nicer tool than Subversion. So um, this is part of that, um, how we can use Git better, um, how we can improve our workflow, how we can make it easier, particularly for casual contributors, to submit patches to the project. One of the things the project has been very bad about historically is that we um, accept your patch if you can navigate through whatever maze of documentation to where to submit it, and then we ignore it forever. And I was hoping with pull requests we might be able to, to break that habit. We still have the confusing documentation about where to submit changes because this is so new and still a little experimental, but I'm hoping to uh, take it for, uh, from the experimental phase into production so that we can document it and, and people who submit can rely on it. Now, the ideal pull request that I wanted to have when I started this experiment was um, a change that's ready to go and easy. Something that isn't contentious, something that doesn't change the defaults, something that doesn't add system D to the base system. Um, you know, anything that uh, it would be difficult to review. Uh, the system D one would be hard because it's large, it would be large and uh, contentious uh, in addition. So there's a political and a uh, technical aspect to it. Um, you know, these are more for small bug fixes, uh, corrections to documentation and those sorts of things uh, initially, although people uh, added features that were uh, small and tractable, uh, which has been a pleasant surprise. I'm also hoping that as we uh, move forward with this, we can integrate it more into our culture um, uh, so that developers get in the habit of looking at pull requests and reviewing the ones that uh, they find interesting. And I was also hoping to be able to recruit new talent to the project because um, one of the things that uh, Kirk's talk showed earlier, um, I didn't know he, he would have that talk, but his talk showed earlier that um, we're an aging group and we need to get uh, some younger people interested in the project. So here's some, let me give a little bit of boring background. I'm gonna talk about what I'm gonna assume people know. I'm gonna assume you kind of know Git, although I'll have a few Git command examples. I and mean, this isn't really a tutorial on Git, uh, but it does kind of walk you through the main steps uh, to kind of give you signposts so that you know how to uh, proceed if you get stuck or aren't, um, aren't clear on what you should do at any particular step. I'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk a lot about GitHub, but it's not gonna be a tutorial on GitHub. I have a couple of walkthroughs for the, for the GUI on GitHub because it's a little confusing and there's a couple of steps that if you haven't done before, you're like, what do I do? Um, and hopefully this will smooth that out, but it's not gonna talk about all the options or anything. Um, I'm also gonna talk about FreeBSD expectations. When we get a pull request, there's certain things we expect from it. Is it interesting? Is it useful? Does it meet whatever standards the project has? And I'll get into what all of those are. Um, and then finally, uh, this is a very new area. This is an area where there's a lot of ways people uh, can help out. Um, I've learned a lot of stuff, and I still don't know half of what GitHub can do. And I'm, so I'm sure there's some help that people that are very familiar with GitHub can give, and I'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so one may ask, why GitHub? There's been kind of a resistance in the project to using GitHub, uh, and uh, why, why, did, why did I choose to land pull requests from that? Well, the answer is very simple. That's where people are. And the project doesn't have to trust GitHub to be able to use GitHub services. 
Right now, uh, the project's source of truth is located inside the project. We maintain security on that machine, and we push changes to GitHub so that people can collaborate there. And we also push changes to uh, GitLab and Codeberg, but I didn't choose either of those because none of them had uh, active pull requests. Well, GitHub, um, if we don't do anything, we get pull requests. Um, so this was kind of an easy way to get our feet wet with continuous integration and accepting pull requests for what the project ultimately does. Maybe it's moved to GitHub. Maybe it's moved to one of the self-hosting Git um, things like Garrett or Git-T or, sorry, for Django. Um, we don't know what that is yet, but this would be a good learning experience for that. Um, not just because of the tooling, but some of the social aspects. How do you um, encourage people to submit? How do you reward them in a way that they want to submit again? Um, those sorts of things we can learn from the GitHub request, and all of that will transfer over to whatever our final solution uh, for the project is in this area. Um, I also chose GitHub over Fabricator for this experiment because uh, GitHub is more, uh, changes are more discoverable. And by that I mean it's easy for me to go to GitHub and look at the changes. Uh, right now it's because we have only three pull requests open, um, but uh, even when there's 100 or 200 pull requests open, GitHub allows me to make queries and filter down to a manageable number to look at right now, whereas uh, uh, Fabricator doesn't. And I'll get into some other reasons why um, this isn't a good fit for Fabricator here in a second. Um, so the, the target audience really is um, people who are making small changes, um, who want to improve the system, who you know, stub their toe on something and don't want to stub it in the next release and take the time to figure out what it is and fix it, to you know, fix the man page that's wrong or to um, you know, add this new feature that uh, scratches an itch for them and it's done in a way that everybody might want to scratch the same itch. Um, it's designed mostly for, for casual people who want to get involved with the project but don't want to make a commitment, have small to medium-sized changes that are easily manageable, um, and you know, ways to learn how the project uh, once commits for people that might be aspiring to something more as well. Um, I also see this as potentially a good way for vendors to submit patches and new drivers. Uh, right now we have vendor commits that we hand out to different vendors who have hardware that's interesting to FreeBSD, but it's kind of a cumbersome process and uh, it's very tied to an individual, but in a lot of the companies that make hardware that is interesting for FreeBSD to run on, people change roles all the time, people move around, and so if there was a single point that you know, the managers, or, uh, the management of the group could document uh, to submit things, then we wouldn't necessarily have to have a, a, a single point of contact in, in, uh, in the vendor, which uh, can be prone to failure sometimes. Um, this talk also, and my experiment, focused on the base system. That's the files that live in the source repository. Ports and docs are also doing their own experimentation with GitHub pull requests. Uh, their criteria to evaluate them is different, and the speed at which they've adopted uh, the pull requests uh, varies from the source, uh, but it's still good. So if you have a contribution in that area, you may be able to do it as a pull request. You're more likely to get redirected than uh, here, although there'll be some times you might be redirected. And pull requests are only a, one part of the bigger FreeBSD story. We're still going to use Bugzilla for bugs. This isn't going to, we're not going to use GitHub issues. Um, bugs are, Bugzilla is still the place to document bad behavior, although we would probably, uh, in the future, like to de-emphasize it as a place to submit patches for the base system. Because um, pull requests work better. It's a better tool. It's easier to do. It's easier to rebase, to update, than a patch that's sitting in Bugzilla. We, we have some tooling to do that, but it's more awkward than Git. Um, we're still going to have uh, the source of truth be inside the project. We're still going to use CGit for the moment. Uh, that part of things isn't going to change because of this, um, although there might be some new things that happen in the future. Uh, we're still going to use Fabricator for developer review. Um, and when I talk about Fabricator in a second, I'll say why. Um, 
And I'm hoping this will complement the continuous integration efforts we have. We have uh, a good set of tests that we run on each commit after the fact. And GitHub Actions let us uh, run some of that before. And so it could be a resource even for developers who might push to GitHub and create a pull request just to get the um, CI that's on GitHub done. And then they'll close the pull request and push it themselves. So um, it, I'm, I'm viewing this as very complementary. And also, uh, very most of the things that we do, um, the integration might change in the future if we choose to change tools. But what they do, um, the, the integration tests will still be the same. How we run them might, might be different. Today we run them in Jenkins. We might also be able to run them in GitHub or for Django or whatever in the future. And this might help us understand some of the limits of that. Our full test suite takes three hours to run, and we would run out of uh, GitHub's patience very quickly if we tried to run that for every pull request and every commit that was pushed. So this will also help uh, figure out the balance, uh, the balances we need to have with the limited resources that are available for free. And as always, this isn't going to replace mailing lists. There will be some changes. I kind of jokingly said uh, system D. But there are some changes where uh, it changes a particular default that's been that way forever. And there needs to be a discussion before that default is changed. Now, as a casual contributor, you might not necessarily know that before you come to, to GitHub. So there's no shame or anything in coming to GitHub with a change like this. Um, the volunteers that handle the pull requests will politely redirect or say, yeah, this needs to be talked about. It's a network change. And it, I'm not sure it's quite right. Well, you should talk about that on net before we finalize on a solution and then come back when that's, the solution is agreed upon by everybody and has the sign off. Uh, for a lot of changes, that's not going to happen. But, but there may be some. And, and that discussion will still take place primarily on mailing lists. So why not Fabricator? Fabricator is a great review tool. If you're a developer and you have changes, we've got some tooling that makes it easy to push a set of changes into Fabricator and get feedback from different people that you tag. But um, that's great for developers because developers know how to find out who is working in a particular part of the, the tree uh, and add them for changes. Plus, once all of the review is done, they have the ability to then go, OK, we'll push it in. If you're just a casual contributor and you create a Fabricator account, which, by the way, is one more account and one more set of emails and kind of a hassle, why can't I already use this thing I already have um, with GitHub? Um, even if you climb that hill and push it in, you might not know who to tag for review, so you might not get a review at all. You might think that's automatic, which is not an unreasonable thought coming to the pro project um, naively. Um, not knowing how we work. People that are in the project know that that's probably not going to lead to success. But people outside the project don't know that. So if we point people to Fabricator and then drop the requests on the floor, that just leads to frustration. Um, also, when every, the review is done, if they do get a review and everything's done, there's nobody responsible um, with Fabricator to push the changes in. With GitHub pull requests, there's a, uh, a set of responsible people who have said, hey, this is the place to come, and then this is, we'll go ahead and land the changes here um, that you need to have committed. So Fabricator is not a, uh, it's a good thing for developers, but it's, it's not so good to point um, casual contributors to because of the barriers to entry are so high and the odds of frustration uh, with that process are, are so high as well. So getting started, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic flow of commits. Um, before I get started and, and tell you about it in detail. And I've color coded this. So um, project resources are green. So FreeBSD has our source of truth, Git repository. Um, developers push commits into the main branch and several other branches, but I left those off for simplicity. Developer actions, um, these are people that have permission to commit to the repository, are coded in turquoise. And once the developer pushes in the commit, a cron job kicks off every 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, publishes these changes to our GitHub um, uh, public mirror. Uh, we also have one on GitLab and on uh, Codeberg. Um, I left those out for simplicity, uh, but this kind of helps you understand the process if you want to submit a pull request. So if you want to submit a pull request, 
what you do as a user, which I've color-coded in this lovely orange color, um, is you fork the FreeBSD repository, uh, you make your changes, you create a branch, and then um, when you push that, uh, you can create a pull request from that. Uh, once the pull request is reviewed and ready to go, a developer will pull it down into a staging area where they'll run some additional tests, maybe add, do a few tweaks uh, if they're really minor style things or really minor um, problems with the commit message, add some metadata to the commit message, um, and then um, once everything's good, they will push it back into the FreeBSD source of truth, and the whole cycle starts over again. So creating a fork, well, how do you do that? Um, the easiest way is using GitHub's uh, GUI interface. So um, I have uh, the FreeBSD GitHub repo um, on GitHub. Uh, you do just navigate there and click the fork button. It's kind of hidden over here and kind of hard to see. A uh, pop-up will say, hey, this, you haven't forked this yet, and you can create your repository, and you click down here to create a fork. And then that brings this up. There's a, you can change the name and change some, a couple of other attributes, um, and then click down here, and now you have a fork. Um, and it'll bring you to this screen, where you'll need to, um, if you're going to make changes, you're going to have to pull this down to a development machine, a FreeBSD machine, or maybe a different, although it doesn't have to be FreeBSD, depending on the nature of the changes. Um, and here, you would just um, click on the, for, on, the, on the code button, and then select HTTPS or SSH, and then click on uh, the little cut and paste button. So you can then type git clone, and then paste this big long URL that it will give you. Um, I've set the origin to be GitHub because some of my later examples uh, assume that. Uh, in the FreeBSD documentation, when you pull from the FreeBSD repo, um, this might be FreeBSD. That's more a developer thing, so I wanted to also have them be separate. Um, and this is just a standard clone where it pulls down everything, and then you um, CD into that. And then to do a pull request, all pull requests are based on Git branches. So the first thing you need to do is create a branch. You um, edit your files with VI or Emacs or whatever your favorite editor is, or if you're in a bad mood, your least favorite editor. Um, and then you commit everything and then go through this, and eventually it'll be ready. And when it's ready, you push it to GitHub, and you, you, know, you get the, the normal thing when you push. And GitHub helpfully adds this information down here, which tells you how to create a pull request. So here's the pull request it has you create. Um, if you're really observant, you'll notice I switched from QEMU BSD user for the earlier ones to BSD imp here. I just noticed that. Um, so it should be the same, but you know, you'll get this URL, you click on it, and it'll bring up uh, the pull request. Now, I've decided to have a slightly controversial pull request as my example. I went in and I deleted the dash V code from cat because it's harmful, right? Just listen to Rob Pike. Um, he published a whole paper on it. I've got ample justification. Well, this, this would be an example of a change that needs to be talked about because um, just because Rob Pike says it's bad doesn't mean the community doesn't love this particular feature. Anyway, to create the pull request, you'd go down here and create the pull request. Um, and then, you know, you go through the uh, review process on GitHub. I'm not going to go into that in detail. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, to do that, GitHub has several videos on how to interact with members. Um, if you're a developer and interacting with people on GitHub, be polite, be welcoming. Uh, thank them for their contribution, their time. Um, but eventually, there'll be a conversation about this, and it'll be time... Um, for you to update your change. And um, you need to push it again, and you need to do a force push here. And force pushes are generally dangerous, so I have the particular force push that's less dangerous. Uh, force push with lease that will update the pull request. People reviewing the pull request will see it, um, and it'll iterate until it's ready to go. And then once it's ready, either the pull request lands and everybody's happy, or we say, sorry, we don't want this. 
and uh, everybody's sad. Well, at least you're sad. I have a pull, one less pull request to deal with. Um, so the first steps. Here's kind of the criteria that we use to evaluate pull requests. So the first step is done automatically. When you create the pull request, GitHub will run a certain number of actions. Um, and we'll try to do cross builds, and we'll do some style checking. Um, in the future, there'll be other things checked, like is the commit message in the right format? Um, if uh, you're making a man page change, does it still does the man do the changes still comply with what Igor likes? Igor is a man page checking tool, um, but all this automation happens so that uh, volunteers don't have to spend time doing this, and also so that people that are contributing get the feedback more quickly. You submit the change, you see a problem, go, oh, I can fix that, and you know this goes around a few times. Um, we generally won't look at a uh, pull request until everything is fixed and working, although there are a couple of jobs with uh, Cirrus CI that um, will sometimes always fail, not because of anything you've done, but because after June 1st, um, we're done with our credits for the month. Um, with uh, the Sierra CI folks, so we can't um, rely on them. We're trying to find ways around this, but you know, for now it's there. We have the rules there um, so that uh, developers can push to their fork of the project and get the CI runs done um, automatically without having to set a, a bunch of stuff up. So once you get through all the automated stuff, um, We'll get in, a volunteer will look at the, the pull request, we'll try to get to it within a few days. Uh, sometimes that will be a little longer, sometimes shorter, depending on the volunteer time. Um, the first thing we'll do is, is this change important enough? You know, it takes a fair amount of time for the developer, uh, the volunteers that look at this, the changes to uh, get the changes into the tree, and it has to be worth their time, because if, uh, they're dealing with something that's trivial, they can't be dealing with something that's more important. And so we want to prioritize the more important things so that those make it into the tree. So uh, generally typo fixes aren't uh, wanted, particularly just for comments that the user doesn't see. Now if it's in a man page or a, a user visible message, that's a different story. Um, we would accept that. Um, and there's a number of automatic checkers that people will They'll run their automated test tool. Maybe it's something they've developed. Maybe it's a standard thing. And the, it'll recommend changes. And they will take those changes, cut and paste them into a branch, and submit them to us with very little thought or curation. Those sorts of pull requests aren't very helpful either, because then the volunteer has to go through, and this is good, and that's bad. And does this create a security problem or not? Or you know, it, it becomes very difficult to. to measure what the code is doing against some theoretical possible undefined behavior that may or may not be a problem. So generally changes like that we try to discourage. Um, if it's uh, something you found this way and you've done the analysis, oh, I found this signed error and this signed error can lead to this overflow in this case because we don't check that and this fixes it. Well, that's completely different than um, I ran FlexLint on um, the entire tree and here's 3,000 complaints that it recommended that we make. There's no way we could review that. The chances of you being nefarious and slipping something into that are also relatively high, particularly given the XZ uh, incident that happened recently where a developer uh, went to considerable effort to sneak uh, backdoor into XZ. Um, if we just willy-nilly merge changes, we open ourselves up to something like that that's actually very low effort on the part of, of an attacker, and that's too much of a risk for the project. So you know, does it fix a real problem? Does it solve a real problem? Is, is it generally worth our time to look at? Um, and so we'll make that evaluation initially, and we'll provide feedback um, uh, uh, in general. Oftentimes, I can just glance at something and go, yeah, that's good, and we'll go on from there to the next stage. Is this change correct? OK, you say this prevents a buffer overflow. Does it really? Did you deal with all the edge cases? You know, this is where the code review part happens. Um, you change the man page to say that this does this. Well, does it really do that or not? 
you know, or does it say it in a way that's awkward and there's a better way to say it or there's a better phrase that is typically used for that thing. So you know, that's, that sort of thing will be um, reviewed. And does it integrate well to the FreeBSD system? Um, there's a number of specialized things the FreeBSD has that um, hopefully any changes would integrate with. If it's relevant, does it integrate with jails? Does it integrate with the uh, rc.d um, init stuff? If it's supposed to start automatically and, and so forth. So you know, we'll provide feedback and say, yeah, this looks good. Um, you added this feature, but you didn't add the man page. You know, that's part of the integration. We have man pages with the system. So if you added a new flag to dash to ls, you know, dash uh, smiley face emoji, and you didn't put it in the man page, then you know, we'll say, hey, add this to the man page. Or probably we'll say, why are you doing emojis uh, when most of the shells can't even express that? But you know, it's, uh, if it's not documented, we, we try not to uh, commit it. Um, and then style. FreeBSD has its own style. We've been a project that's been around for 30, 40, 50 years that had a style that started at Bell Labs that then went to Berkeley and then evolved independently in the FreeBSD project. So there's a large code base that's written with this evolving style. So uh, we may have you rework your code a little bit to conform to the style. One of the automated things we do have in place is a style checker that catches at least the most egregious um, style problems that we have, we have noticed that people often submit. Um, we try not to jump first to the style stuff in the past. People would uh, submit huge pull or you know, huge diffs and we would just comment on the style and then when they fixed that, nothing else happened. So we try to make sure that the change is right and the change is worthwhile before we ask the contributor to go to that effort as well. That's just, first of all, it's politeness, and second of all, it gives better feedback and it's a better flow. Better to get the thing right and then make it look good than to make it look good and then not get feedback or have to make it right and then there's a whole another set of work that you've wasted to, to get to that point. Um, and again, you know, does it generally fit with the FreeBSD architecture and stuff. And this is something that a casual contributor might not know, but it will be feedback that we'll try to give people. Um, it might be something they know about or mis and misunderstand or misapply it, and the experts that we review uh, the changes with hopefully will provide that feedback so that they can make the change better and get the new feature or uh, whatever into the system. And another problem that we've had um, the change has to be reviewable. So it needs to be about the right size. And in general, for most changes, that's um, a pull request that has you know, maybe fewer than 10 commits, although that's just a, some guidance. It's not a hard and fast rule. Maybe less than 200, 300 lines. Um, some changes that are 50 lines are almost impossible to um, review because they're so, so spaghetti. And some changes that are 500 lines are super easy to review uh, because it's easy to check. Uh, so it's hard to have a, uh, you know, a, a definite cutoff, but this is a suggestion if you're not sure. You know, if you have 500 lines and you're not sure, you can break it up, or you can submit it as one thing, and we'll tell you to break it up if it's too much. Um, so, and this is, so again, if, it, if we can't review it, we can't make sure that malicious code doesn't sneak into the system this way. Um, also, if we can't review it, we can't, um, help you make it better. Um, when things get above a certain size, people just look at it and go, oh, I'm gonna go to the next one that's easy. Uh, so you know, kind of bear that in mind as well. If you have a lot of changes, you might need to break them up. Um, and you might get the feedback that uh, you need to break them up. And it's nothing personal, it's just so that we can ensure that uh, we can do things. Also with larger changes, if you have 100 changes and one's wrong, the other 99 aren't getting into the system until that one gets fixed. So it would be better to split things up so that they can go in in smaller chunks as well. Um, sometimes, if it's a particularly large review, we might land the half or so that people, everybody agrees on and the other half that people are talking about will have the submitter rebase and have those conversations finish and then land the results. Um, particularly if the first set of changes are good regardless of whether the second set of changes goes in. Um, and then, you know, I, this, 
Um, you know, this is, uh, again, the right subject is, do we want the changes? Are these changes interesting enough to the project? Um, you know, do they measurably move the needle? Does it make, um, you know, does it test a new test case? Does it um, add a new uh, interesting feature? Does it um, give something that other users are interested in? Basically, is it worth our time and effort to go through this? Because when I land a pull request, um, it takes probably a minimum of 15 minutes of my time, maybe an hour or two, depending on how the testing goes and things I have to look at. And so um, if it's not something that's interesting at all, um, uh, you know, that's just wasted my time that I could have spent making the NVMe driver better or doing some other things that I'm really passionate about, but, you know, set aside because landing pull request is important to the project. So there's the, these balancing tests go on all the way through. Some people that initially review it might think it's worthwhile only later to discover, well, that's not quite the right thing. We might not want it as somebody more seasoned and mature in that part of the system takes a look at it and goes, yeah, it seems like a good idea, but it'll cause these problems. So, um, you know, that, that can happen at any time during this process. Whoa. And I guess the final general one is, are these changes mature enough? Uh, GitHub pull request is not a place to push work in progress generally. Um, unless you have the specific caveat, I'm pushing this work in progress to run the CI tests. And then once they run, we would expect you to go ahead and close it so it doesn't appear on the list of things for volunteers to take a look at. We're trying very hard to keep the pull requests, um, the number of pull requests we have open small. Um, so we want to limit them to the ones that are actively being worked on, um, haven't gone stale, that uh, still have a chance of landing. And one, once we figure out that something doesn't have a chance of landing, we'll go ahead and close that. But if we close it, uh, it's not being ready or not being mature, um, there's no shame in that. You can just reopen a new pull request later and we'll, as, as the um, software matures more, and we can take a look at it and go, okay, yeah, now it's mature enough, or maybe here's some, better, some more feedback for you to make it better. Um, so the, the whole process is about making these changes good um, and also uh, making it so that the limited volunteer time that we have uh, can be best focused on the changes with the highest probability of making it into the tree. Um, out of the last 60 or so changes that I've landed, um, uh, pull requests I've landed the, that we've done this year, maybe f four or five I closed because they weren't ready, weren't mature, uh, were to a stable branch. We don't accept pull requests for a stable branch um, at this time anyway. Uh, you know, those sorts of things um, get closed, but the vast majority of the other ones we were able to iterate through and figure out, yeah, this is good, and go in, or the um, original contributor goes, oh, wait, this is the wrong way, let me back off and do something else. Um, and then finally, I, guess I think this is finally, I have way too many of these slides. Um, this can be good for vendor driver changes or vendor, new vendor drivers. Um, because the barrier to entry is low, they don't have to find a developer who's willing to shepherd it through the process to commit. They can commit to this one central place, do a pull request, and have the driver available to everybody, both for testing, it's a very open process then, um, as well as uh, for developers then to come and make the decision, is this an interesting driver, or um, you know, is this a... Um, uh, you know, a USB device that monitors goldfish bowls in um, Alberta. Um, that might be a little bit too narrow to be interesting to the rest of the project. So uh, this also gives us a place to uh, send people to that uh, might not have done this multiple times, and they can also learn some of the ins and outs of getting things into FreeBSD through this process. Um, I've given some bad examples uh, throughout. Um, we had... Uh, Early on, we had several people that submitted scanner bugs, um, bugs that they got from uh, scanners uh, that turned out to be completely theoretical. You make this change, and it doesn't even change the generated code. Um, you, um, or you make this change, and it actually introduces a, pro a different problem. So if you're fixing one problem and breaking another problem, that's not really something that's good. Um, and that's one of the things that we hope to find through the testing that we do before we commit it. 
um, in that staging area I had up earlier, um, we're testing the commit to make sure that it doesn't break uh, the, the, the current test cases that work or that um, it prevents booting for some unforeseen reason or whatever. So those are some of the, the, the bad sorts of things that you want to avoid. Um, and yes, this is very much a judgment call, but it's not a judgment about you, it's a judgment about the code. The code isn't something we want. And that's something I want to reiterate, that if we say we no thank you to the code, that is, doesn't say you shouldn't try again um, or you shouldn't do other contributions. It's just that that particular thing isn't a good fit for us. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, and talk about ways that uh, you can help with this process. Because I'm just one person, and right now I'm spending a fair amount of time. Um, in the past month, I've probably spent, uh, let's see, my boss is on a plane now. I've spent probably 10 hours a week, or 15 hours a week, uh, managing pull requests. And we've gone from um, having, uh, at, at the height, I think I had 102 as the most. We have three open now. And it's not just me. Mark has landed some changes. Ed has landed some changes. Um, there are other people that have helped out with that as well. But I've done a, a lot of that. And that's not a sustainable thing for the project. So we need uh, some help. The first thing we need help with is kind of the experience people have when they come to the project. Um, there's a number of things that we can do with automation that, oh, you've, you, this is your first time commit. We can have a, a little GitHub action that says, oh, this is your first time contribution. Thank you so much for thinking about us. You know, we'll get back to you within a week or however long we've decided you know, people um, is, is a reasonable time to wait. Um, and then when things get updated, they can change tags and move things around so that it's easier for volunteers that want to land the pull request to find just those pull requests that are ready to land and we don't have to click through five or six to find, oh yeah, th there, this discussion's still going on. This, this guy was asked for changes and hasn't given it. Uh, this gal is, uh, oh, this one's ready to go. I can do this. You know, I can go right to that, that third one and say, oh, this is ready to go. Um, I can start my testing to make sure it's really ready to go. Um, but then it's worth my, my time, and I don't have to waste that other time. Um, and the more checking that we can do on GitHub, um, the more, uh, the higher the likelihood that when I, we, the volunteer lands it to stage the request to, to push it in, that it, all those tests will pass, and it'll go in. And it won't be, oh, you know, these things failed, I need to provide the feedback and delete my tree and do all this stuff. And um, I just spent 20 minutes and I can't um, close a pull request. So, um, and the other thing we'll need help with is uh, the project has kind of a fussy commit uh, message uh, style. We have some guidelines that we, we uh, want to enforce, but um, right now the way those get enforced is when I pull the request down and I notice that the commit message is wrong, I'll fix it. Um, rather than have the uh, submitter fix it and know how to fix it so that the process is smoother for me in the future, um, landing the request so I don't have to um, you know, do that. The more I, we can train new people, um, the better. Uh, but we also understand that a lot of these um, might be drive-bys. Somebody does something, they do this, it's the one thing they only do. They don't really need to learn anything. So you know, we're, as volunteers, all, are constantly making trade-offs. Do we provide the feedback and make them change this, or do I just do it? And sometimes it's faster to just do it, but if it's somebody who's made a couple of other mistakes uh, on previous ones but has fixed those, I'm more likely to say, hey, why don't you fix this? So it teaches the lesson and, and, and cements it in their mind for when the next one they commit is. So um, there may be a little bit of different experience from person to person based on the history of the, the commits from that person. But we need to have um, you know, better action. The other thing that we need help with um, is tooling. Um, right now we have some very rudimentary scripts that will do the staging that I talked about. Um, Mark has done a nice script for CI, but I haven't integrated it yet. Um, we've got some scripts for pushing, but they're fragile. If there's a commit race, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't to do the rebase and um, repush so that uh, everything works right. Um, and having context sensing uh, sensitive checking 
is also important. So if somebody submits a man page, um, we run uh, Igor against the result and see if the results differ from before and after um, to suggest changes for that person. Um, if somebody submits Lua code, we run the Lua checker. If somebody submits shell code, we run um, the shell checker that we like uh, so that we can give feedback um, ideally in GitHub, but if not in GitHub, then um, the individual developer can run these and submit them if, it, if it's too hard to set up in GitHub, although eventually we would want to move that to GitHub. Uh, so that's all I have prepared for today. Um, we have a few minutes for questions um, still, uh, I guess 20 minutes for questions. So um, if you're volunteering to do mic work, hopefully we'll have enough questions for that. Um, so what questions do you have? Is this a question in back or? Okay. So the sound guy always gets preference. <laughs> Oh, yes. So is there a path to getting a source commit bit through Git, through this, to using GitHub? And if so, is this eventually going to render the whole commit bit process useless if there isn't one? So okay, that, so um, that's a very good question. Um, it's, um, even though you had the mic, it's worth repeating. Um, is this a path to a commit bit? And the answer is yes. One of the things that I would like to use it for is, I had talked earlier about recruiting in kind of a vague way. But one of the things I'd like to do is, um, there so far have been four, maybe five people that are habitual commit, or habitual pull requesters. And those four or five people I'm trying to work with to commit, get a commit bit. Because I think it's important to, so to grow the number of people that can commit directly to the, uh, the, the repo. Um, and I think it's also important to kind of grow the community of developers. Um, we haven't pulled in enough developers this year, um, or as many as I would like. So yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that, um, there's a new group that was just announced at the developer summit called Source Manager. One of the things Source Manager will do is go, oh, in the last month or two months, you know, these are the people that have committed, and you know, these 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 folks have submitted more than ten or whatever the number is. We come up with, we should talk to them. We should actively mentor them. We should find people they can work with in the project that fits their needs or fits their interests, um, you know, and uh, you know, help build up our. Uh, team, build our bench so that we have uh, more people that can help out and contribute. And so it also becomes easier for these people to push it in directly and I don't have to deal with it. I mean, I'm, the, the selfish reason is if I can get somebody else to do the work, I'm all over that. So absolutely, it's, it's, um, it will get you noticed and can get you a commit bit and it kind of replaces the submitting too many things uh, criteria that we have in the past, or augmented, I should say. If you, you are noticed via other means, we'll still do that. So this is kind of a new way to, to get noticed as well. Um, yeah, so um, are there other questions? Uh, uh, over uh, behind you will be easiest. And then otherwise, you're down and back up and down and around, and that's. Um, this is only tangentially related to the talk, but one of the yeah. problems I have when checking out uh, FreeBSD source and ports from Git, because I always check out locally, Yes. Because it's such a large repo with um, years of history, um, it takes a long time to check, and there's a git validation step when you clone for the first time. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any shortcuts to, uh, I don't do git shallow or LFS or anything like that. Do you have any shortcuts for that, or do you have any plans to move to submodules or something like that? OK, so um, I'll, let, I'll let you talk. Go ahead, Benedict. Benedict wants to answer. So I'll let Benedict answer, and then I'll add anything that so I, I think might be wrong. I've recently written a previously journal article about that. Uh, so instead of using Git, you use Scalar. It's basically supporting the same options as Git, but has other ways to check out uh, large repos. It was developed by Microsoft because they also have large repos for Windows, you can imagine. So try that out. The article is on the web. You can get it on the foundation's website for the journal. And that should have a couple of good things that makes it much faster, both also for source and the port street. <coughs> So the other half of your question is about submodules. Um, submodules have a very high cost 
um, in terms of things we have to document and just general flow of stuff. If you're always moving forward in the repository, um, they're not bad. But if you have to bisect anything, they, they present problems. Um, so we're looking at ways we can do the vendor imports that we do via submodules, or um, as we go to package base, um, where we package everything up, we might move things um, that really should be in base, but might be borderline into um, just a package that gets built. And so that might also um, help alleviate the load there. It's something we want to do something about, but we, there's no really good thing to do that's a uh, no-brainer win. There's just a bunch of bad alternatives and which one do we want to try, or maybe we wait a little bit and a good alternative is developed. So, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. And I, I didn't know about that tool that Benedict wrote about, so I'll have to look, check that out. Um, here in the middle, I guess. Got a quick question. Uh, um, will these slides be on the website? Yes, I will. I'll create a PDF version and I'll attach it to my talk. I was revising them up until ten uh, thirteen, so I didn't have a chance to do that before the talk. Thank you. So I had a quick question about uh, regression testing. Yes. So I'm sure when you uh, pull changes down, right? When you take the PR you're most definitely running regression tests in your own local device, right? So is there any way we can uh, run those regression suites ourselves to make your life easier when we, before we even go ahead and make the PR? So I'm sure one of the t tests would be uh, boot time, right? We wouldn't want to regress the boot time as is, right? Or maybe we wouldn't want more pressure on memory for some reason, right? Uh, yeah, is this public? Can we find some of these stats? <coughs> so so, so, so that. I'm not sure what exactly what to say. I'll let Mark answer a little bit and while um, the microphone is going over there. The project has a number of tests with Cure right now that you can run beforehand. And um, there's a number of things you can do. There was a Summer of Code student that did boot testing. So if you change the bootloader, you can test the 57 different ways FreeBSD boots across all our different architectures um, using QEMU. Um, uh, but that's an area we need to document better. And it's an area we need to, uh, it's a high friction area that we need to reduce the friction on, knock the rough edges off. And Mark has done something really good with that, so I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, so um, it's historically, so <laughs> it's really hard to test in general, like an operating system change. There's, there's a lot of different test suites you can run. Um, there's, you know, like, yeah, you could test boot time, um, but even doing that in a, in a sort of sane way is, is quite difficult. Anyway, the point is, um, so FreeBSD does have a large regression test suite. Um, ideally, we would run it uh, every time we make a change or you know, modulo things like man page changes and so on. Um, so running the FreeBSD regression test suite is actually not easy. You have to you know, build all of the FreeBSD bits. You have to install them somewhere. Probably you want to boot the result in a VM and then actually run the regression test suite in there because it does things like load kernel modules and do all sorts of destructive things. So um, uh, lately I've been working on a script which automates all of those kinds of steps. So you have a single command which you know, clones the repository or takes an existing clone if you want and builds the VM image and boots the VM and runs all the tests and gives you a report. Um, so if you want to come talk to me about that after. So it's, it's something I presented a couple days ago um, and it's not quite ready, um, but I have it on GitHub and you can use it on FreeBSD today. Um, so that's kind of the Something like that is going to be the long-term answer. So today, it's it's a manual process, um, but we're we're making that easier. And so, you, the answer to your question is kind of <laughs> like it's it's still being worked on um, the automation side of things, but yeah, and it's getting better. And when we stage the commits, we're still we're making value judgments. Oh, this changes one command. I'll compile that command, make sure that everything works. Maybe run the test suite for that one command, um, and then. Uh, push the changes, or you know, this changes a kernel mod, uh, something in the kernel. I'll build the kernel and boot it, or yeah. it changes a .h file, so I'll build the kernel and I'll build world on all the platforms. Because usually, when I don't, somebody the the CI raises a flag and I have to make another commit, and I hate that. But um, you know, we try to make those value judgments now. But um, that's the sort of thing uh, with the context sensitive reviewing that I would like to you know 
push all that knowledge out of my head and out of Mark's head into a script so that anybody can do it. And so that you can make the man page change and run this thing and get an answer right away or make um, a change uh, to the buffer cache and get an answer in a week. Yeah, yeah. So sometime, some, sometime, sometime tomorrow, <laughs> depending yeah. I mean, on the hardware you have. It, it's going to be a long time before any of that is like, well, before it's all automated. Some judgment is, is going to be needed for a long time because yeah, yeah, yeah. change to LS is not the change, the, not the same as a change to you know the, the VM system or something. And yeah. So um, you need to have some some way to express what you want. Um, and sort of on that topic, I guess I, I have a sort of follow up question, which is like, we want this stuff to run from GitHub Actions, and GitHub does not support FreeBSD as a sort of target. Correct. Um, Asterisk. <laughs> I we if in an ideal world where I could have all the ponies, I would want that pony. Yeah. Um, well, but um, there are ways we can provide resources to have GitHub runners in the project, yeah. and I would like to be able to spin up a jail, run the thing, and then throw the jail away after we test it because it's contaminated, um, and have that result show up with the artifacts on GitHub. Um, that's a fair amount of work. Nobody's done the work. That should have been a bullet point on my slide, and that, that was an oversight on my part. So this is a very good question. Well, I mean, yeah. That, so, so a couple of follow-up comments, I guess. Yeah. So, so self self-hosted GitHub action runners, you can run them in a FreeBSD jail, for instance. I think I mentioned this a few yeah. days ago. Like David Chisnell has a has a thing. I think it's called like GitHub action runner for FreeBSD. So you run it in a jail, and it can talk like it's a client that talks to GitHub and can pull it and get action jobs and run them. Right. Um, I'm just wondering if I've kind of already painted myself into a corner by making this script that I talked about mostly only running on FreeBSD. Like, is it is it going to be really useful to be able to do these kinds of things from Linux or Mac OS just to be able to support GitHub Actions in the cloud? <coughs> or is that is that something we can kind of live with? Because the way I've done it is is, you know, I wanted to make a bunch of libraries that interact with FreeBSD in a native way. So you can do Beehive, you can use Beehive and so on, but um, maybe that's not really the right thing. Um, I, th I suspect that having it on FreeBSD is better than what we have before I found out about it, which was that's true. almost nothing. Um, uh, you know, a, a ragtag set of scripts that almost kind of work. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a good first step, and I think we're gonna receive feedback that says, um, maybe from the Cherry folks that yeah. says, hey, we'd like to run this on Ubuntu 24.3 or whatever their, well, their, their thing that's, is. That's what their thing, like that's what Cherry Build already does, right? It's right. designed explicitly to, to run on multiple platforms. And so right. it's like, well, maybe I should have, <laughs> maybe so, I should have done that too. So maybe, maybe, maybe we'll wind up importing that. They're open to contributing it, but I don't know if they have the resources to drive that. No, it, it would need a fair bit of work. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. So I think I think your script eventually will evolve in that direction is my guess, um, but you might not be the one that does that. Yeah. You know, it's the itch to scratch. I have my Mac and I want it to work, and and you know the, the one thing that's keeping me from it is this thing doesn't run on Mac. Let me, you know, do that because my Mac is way faster than any other machine that I have. Uh, that's not sitting in a box. So. I'll just say yeah. Lua, Lua is a terrible cross-platform programming language, so <laughs> I'd probably need to rewrite it. If I did, that's all. Yeah. It, it's I think we can also run into the problem of if we depend on free cloud resources that run Linux or whatever, is that like Sirius CI, they tend to run out. Right, and very right. So while being able to use GitHub's native runners to run some of these things by just using our ability to compile FreeBSD from Linux, might help, but we're likely going to run into we're out of resources and we have to host it ourselves anyway. Yeah. So maybe Mark script is closer to what we want most of the time. Anyway. Yeah, if we have to have our own thing anyway, you mm. know, Mark scripts can be the trigger to um, David Chisnell's um, GitHub runner thing that listens and talks to, to GitHub. So, you know, it, we, ha we need the pieces and we need to start putting them together. Um, uh, you know, six months ago, we didn't have a lot of the pieces. And so as we get more of these pieces, we can put them together and find out how well they work and how well they don't work. So is there anything else there or should we go to the next question? Okay, over here. Then. I had uh, one quick one. 
Have we looked at using the pull request template system on GitHub to, for example, prompt the person to fill out some of the metadata we expect, like sponsored by and uh, fixes and, and all the stuff that we have in our commit message template on when you install Git on FreeBSD, but in the web interface when you create a pull request on GitHub? We've not done that. I know that it exists, okay, and that's a great like checklist. Huh? I have. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, we've done that. <laughs> you can also put checklists of things that the user right. We, we we need to expand it and make it make it better. Um, I, I know I've done some GitHub things, and they don't leave a lasting memory. But yeah. we could you use can. more, and that's an area of where you know more eyes and more people looking at it. You know, I've seen other projects like uh, Open, Open ZFS yeah, exactly. do that, and it's like, oh, we should do that. And I think I did a template, but it's kind of crappy. Yeah. So. Um, if anybody wants to contribute, that's a great area as well. Mm -hmm. It's not too meta, really. <laughs> so anyway, the next question should be over here. So there's two things that I kind of wanted to comment, comment on. One was uh, that there is a great cautionary tale in uh, the way that GNOME used uh, the CI, um, where they, in fact, used all of their credits, the credits that they'd received from, from Google, uh, within three months, right, instead mm -hmm. of the year that they intended to. Uh, they're not the only ones. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then uh, the other thing was that uh, there is a, con if so f in the Linux world, there's the continuous kernel integration uh, suite that they use, and one of the things that I really enjoy about that uh, CKI is that it provides a lot of that feedback uh, directly to the um, to the committer. So I'm wondering if there's a uh, if you're expecting to do less less of a human review and more of a more of an automated review. I think we uh, we would like to do that if if we had good tests that could provide that information. Um, we have some proxies for that that are kind of not very good. Uh, oh, do all the cross builds work? Well, that's close enough for work working on FreeBSD, you know, for the volunteers to look at it. But it would be great if you know you submit the pull request, we uh, you know something notices that runs make tender box and provides comments. Um, it's not really an action, but it provides comments on the pull request that says um, on PowerPC Little India and this breaks. And in this way, these are the error messages. And it also breaks on, um, I don't know, risk five or whatever, you know, or we tried to boot it and it hung here, you know, something like that. Um, it isn't necessarily a GitHub action. Um, so you literally get a little check mark with it. But if it provides the feedback, who cares? You know, it, it, that's, you know, the, that feedback is direct to the um, user. And having written some of the GitHub actions, I'm providing feedback in the wrong place for at least one thing right now. So, you know, I think that th those are great ideas. I hadn't thought of them. I didn't realize they existed. But as you suggest them, it becomes, well, of course we want to do that. <laughs> I've wanted to do that since I, you've finished your question. <laughs> It is also hilarious to see just who's responsible for breaking like specific architectures based on their, you know, particular requirements for, mm -hmm. for one or the other. Yeah, we have we have fewer architectures than Linux, um, but we still have enough. That even for changes that I'm sure won't break something, I'll commit it. I'll go to dinner. I'll check my phone, and I have ten email messages from Jenkins saying, "You broke the build," and so I hurry back from dinner and fix it. Um, either my changes I made my personally or pull requests I've landed. So it is, a, it, is, it is a useful thing. And a tool like that would also have a future. I don't want to put too much into GitHub and have it be too tied to GitHub, but I want the integration there. So if there's a tool that goes out and builds it and provides the feedback, well, if we went to Forjango or GitLab or something else, we could then um, retool the wrapping around that and push it to those, those areas as well. So. I think those are great um, responses. I'm not sure how we can organize all the people that want to work on it and to take some of these ideas to make it happen. Um, so if you have any ideas on that, I've tried working groups. And I, the ones that I've constructed, um, Git Migration, I didn't construct but joined and was great. GitHub Next Steps, or Git Next Steps that I did, 
kind of was everybody wanted to be involved, but nobody wanted to do anything. And so I don't know how to get past that. Um, and so if you know, there are people that have better people skills or organizational skills than I have, I would love, uh, I would love their help. So Benedict has a question next. If, there, if, that's, if that's all, that's a very good question. Thank you. So that's a bit tangential, but um, one of the things that you can also do with Git is signing commits. And by default, it's GPG, no one likes it, it's complicated, but there's also a way to do it via SSH. And so all developers already have an SSH key to connect to you know, infrastructure <coughs> from previously. So I'm wondering why don't we use our SSH keys to sign commits to kind of prove that's really us, that we are doing these changes. Um, because we haven't done it yet. There's no good reason not to. We just haven't uh, mandated it or put the infrastructure in place. The only, um, the only caveat, it, that's very good for developers because developers will sign the commit and try to push and lose the race. And so they'll have to rebase and then re-sign the commit and push. And for a developer, that works great. But you know, for Joe Random Committer or Joe Random Contributor who, you know, Makes a, makes a commit and signs it and gives it to me. Well, you know, there's 20 commits in the tree. Now, how do I get that signature from them in when I push it in? Right now, I have to do that via merge request, which we prohibit. Um, and so um, there's some logistical problems with that, even though that's a good idea. And, you know, maybe we should start with um, just having developers do it, but. Um, you know, that's uh, something that I think uh, uh, the, the release engineer or the security officer or somebody should, should drive, or somebody who's not me. It doesn't have to be those people. I don't have the bandwidth for it. So I think we have a, another question here and then Pavel after that, or in the middle and then Pavel. Um, so I just wanted to, to talk about the documentation as part of this process, um, like, you know, as, as you've said, like the, the pull request, accepting pull requests has kind of started as an experiment, but um, you know, piece by piece, there's been improvements to the documentation around that. And um, essentially this, this becomes our stated policy, right? Whether it is still experimental or not. Um, so we have like the, the bits that you get through the GitHub interface, the top level contributing, uh, Markdown page is like pretty good versus what it links to the contribute the old contributor contributing the FreeBSD uh, guide, which is like pretty outdated and confusing, and the developer's handbook, which is even worse. I, I'm gonna kill it before too long, uh, like because <coughs> there it, it it's detrimental, um, except for a couple of chapters. So. I guess for people who are approaching this uh, through the eyes of like trying to contribute through pull requests, it would be good to get your feedback on what is confusing in the documentation. Yes. Um, also on a similar note, um, I had hoped to get this done and published before the talk, but the FreeBSD Journal in a forthcoming issue will be publishing an article I wrote that's basically this talk that spells it out and, and has the, the different steps uh, to go to so that we have that. And I would 100% um, grant my permission to use any and all of that with credit um, in uh, the handbooks or articles or whatever makes sense um, for people to, to grab information from. Okay, so we have a question in the middle and then Pavel. I'm sorry I don't know your name, I'm just calling you the middle. Huh? David Duncan. Oh, okay. David's next and then Pavel. So my question here is this, is that seeing how this is, this is in fact picking up quite a bit of a momentum, is there an initiative do you think should come out of this that uh, to support uh, a FreeBSD Forge? Yes, there is. And in fact, um, Baptiste um, is working on a Forjango instance that tries to solve some of these problems um, where you don't have to fork, you can just push a branch and that creates the pull request. Um, and he's right now kind of stuck on uh, LDAP and user authentication and those kinds of crazy issues because 
you don't want one person to push a pull request that's not known to the community and have somebody come el else who's nefarious come out and hijack it um, and maybe use that person's you know, neutral presence to, you know, maybe there won't be as much scrutiny. You know, so, so there needs to be some, uh, you know, some controls, and he's struggling with that right now, and I don't know. That was the last status I got from him. Um, but yes, I think there, one of the reasons I keep kind of hinting at, well, we're probably not gonna use GitHub. There are people that, when we started out, just you know, put the sucker on GitHub and let everybody figure it out. And um, that was a terrible idea, I thought, because we'll lose a lot of developers and we might not ever gain back you know, gain them back, and that's why we're doing a more incremental approach. And the FreeBSD Forge, um, where we can integrate um, pull requests and code review, and maybe bug tracking a little better, and CI and other things, all within this FreeBSD cluster, um, so we don't have to worry about, well, you know, we gotta have this .NET thing that's only on Linux to, to even begin to play ball in GitHub. You know, it, our efforts might be better spent on Instead of writing that and integrating that, on um, uh, going to the forge, so that's going on in parallel. But I, I do think there's value in doing both, um, particularly if we can set up David Chisnell's stuff to run Mark's script, um, and even if it just does that and reports it and nothing else, we will be way far ahead of where we are today, which is a bunch of uh, cross-compiled jobs that may or may not work, and we may or may not expect them to, do, to, to fail. And so the volunteers might go, oh, there's an X there. I expect that, and not go look at it and go, oh, that's something new. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Pavel. So as for the signing process, uh, for me, uh, as a consumer of FreeBSD, I don't care about Joe Random contributor signature. I, I care about signature of the committer who merged pull, pull requests. So for, for me, that would be imp more important. But uh, I have a di different question. Uh, so that, that's good feedback. Thank you. Uh, so you did mention that uh, we don't welcome like small changes, style changes, typos, and stuff like that, which I think it's uh, we do lose a bit uh, by not doing so. Uh, so first of all, we strive for perfection, don't we? <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, yeah, we do, but uh, the pull requests, my, my point there is there can be a pull request that's too small. If it's just a typo in a comment, that has a cost that we have to offset yes. against it. Yes. But other sorts of typos are, are, are good. We want to try to move the needle um, with things. Now, part of this is a reaction to, there was a class that submitted uh, maybe 100 pull requests that Lee Wynn had to go deal with that were all single or double character typos in comments and that um, the value of all of those together um, is less than all the pull requests I've landed today. So, because I, I landed one that fixed a real bug. Yeah, so that's, that's the second part of my question is that, uh, yes, I would prefer not you to merge those pull requests, right? Right. But maybe we should have some kind of notion of like a junior committer or something like this that could handle something like that. Because also for, from contributors' perspective, I think it's much easier to enter the project with a small change mm -hmm. than something really disruptive and uh, you know you are new to the project and you don't really know how to go around and, uh, and you are shut down because you don't, I know, uh, comply to some requirements somewhere, right? So it, right. it would be great to like, I want to start contributing to the project, I will start with some small style changes or some really small changes that will ease me into the, uh, the whole process, right? Yeah, and I think, I, I think it's gonna be a judgment call of, of when to do that and when not to do that. We don't want you know, a huge raft of style changes that's thousands of lines coming in from somebody who ran um, you know, EscapeX format buffer on PCI.C or ran Clang format on PCI.C. Um, on the other hand, if there's a small change that's a, you know, clearly a style thing that shows their thinking, you know, something like that technically might be against some of the guidelines, but I would land that because it's like, oh, this person's thinking. I want to keep, I want to encourage that and keep that up. Um, this commit isn't perfect, but I'm still going to push it in because it's better than what's there. And so, you know, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the better is very important to this process. And finally, Warner doesn't scale. You're 100% right. We need more, more people that can commit it. 
Right now, there's a technical issue that in order to get the pull request to show is merged in GitHub, you have to push both to um, our repository and to the original uh, submitter's um, GitHub branch. And to do that, you need permission to push to the repo. And, and there's like three people that have that, and I'm one of them. So once the scripts are good and we know they work, we can expand that circle to people that we, we trust not to accidentally push something to GitHub that's crazy. Um, but um, you know, that is still going to be uh, something we have to manage. And that's certainly something in the future. And it's certainly something I'd like, because I don't want to deal with this forever. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that the you know things I don't have to deal with I love particularly things that somebody else is doing well, and I think um, all of the things that all the points that you made are excellent. That you know this is an area that we could potentially get you know more junior people involved. This is an area that we can use to grow their experience and judgment, um, maybe with oversight from some senior people to. You know, to, to give feedback or if they have questions or whatever. I'm not sure exactly how that would look. But I think, um, you know, it becomes a more of a yes, I can, yes, we can um, situation rather than, you know, a big long list of rules that no, you can't do this or that or whatever. Um, by creating the list of rules that I did, I'm just trying to give some, some, some guidance. Um, and now that the landing process is easier, maybe we relax those a little bit. Um, maybe not. I don't want to be flooded, you know, with 50 things, you know, 50 typo requests. But if somebody finds them and, you know, not through automation, but, you know, finds it organically and it submits that, I probably would land that. Or maybe the, the guidance becomes we would land that um, if it moved the needle and wasn't just some, somebody grepping the tree for their misspelled or something. You know, that, that doesn't seem to... That's not the sort of thinking that we want. But if somebody's reading through the buffer cache and finds that you know, there's a typo, particularly if it's a typo that makes sense, you know, that's somebody who's thought about it and submitted it. We want to encourage that and accept that. So that's, that, that is a very good point, a um, uh, very subtle point that I missed when I was uh, you know, listening through the rules. So thank you, Pavel. Uh, just related to that. I a really good example was like URLs going 404 on man pages or something similar, uh, where they're very relatively in similar kind of vein. I just wanted to mention that it might be useful to still accept the PRs or some mechanism of doing that and then bucketing them. Because from my perspective, I've contributed a few things like that over the years to other projects, and I don't really care if it gets solved now. I, I don't want to make it your problem, but at the same time, if there were like a hundred of these things that are really minor, that <coughs> you can just say, okay, these are going to be 15 minutes of my time for all these typos. I'll get to it in two months. It would be nice if there was some mechanism to bucket those together. And I just wanted to mention that like, as somebody who's done that before, it would be nice if that was an option somehow, and yeah, tagging uh, or buffering or of some kind might be used. We'll, we'll, we may, we may reevaluate it. We may just say, you know, class professors don't assign your, you know, students, go fix a typo and submit it to FreeBSD. Maybe that's the feedback we need. Colin is behind you, uh, Alan. Uh, yeah, this may just be the, the same issue about uh, who has maintained your privileges on the tree. But uh, the, the easiest way for my GSOC student to send in patches is to open a pull request. Uh, but so I, I, can, I can grab those and push the, his commits into the tree, but I'm not able to close his pull request. Right. And uh, we might be able to get you permission to close the pull request or even the more permission to do the pushing so that it closes automatically. Um, uh, but I notice when people land changes and I'll close it, and it's not such a high burden that it's not, I'm not ungrateful or anything. In fact, I'm very grateful that when people do this. Fair enough. Um, I, I still feel bad about other people having to, to close things for me. So right. if, if there's a way that all FreeBSD developers are just able to close pull requests. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the people that manage our, our GitHub uh, permissions. Um, I think it's a granularity problem. I think you can close the pull request if you can push to the re repo. And so we don't want to grant it to everybody because um, you know, they accidentally push to GitHub instead of main, and it works because there's no new changes. And then we have to do a push pull request. And then people see different versions 
and have different hallucinations about what FreeBSD is based on where they grab it from, and we don't want to have that problem. So we're being a little cautious about um, adopting that. So. Okay, I see there's lunch. <laughs> um, are there any last questions, or should we break for lunch? Thank you, Werner. Okay, I guess we're breaking for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>